webinar today is going to be taking you through Australia's seafloor. We're going to talk about what's on it, who cares, and how we actually map this. My name is Rachel Proslowski and I'm a marine scientist. So in my career, I've been lucky enough to travel all over Australia's oceans on different vessels. I've worked all the way from the tropical waters of the north down to the temperate waters in the Bass Strait near Tasmania. I've worked in a whole bunch of different depths from our intertidal zone, just near the beach area, all the way to the abyssal plains where we're actually kilometers deep. And it's been an absolute joy to do this. And I'm really excited to share some of my findings and some of my learnings with you today. So before we go any further, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page when I say seafloor. Some of you might not actually know what I'm talking about. So what this means is the part of the ocean that's at the very bottom when we get to the ground, which is what we would call it if it were on land. Now the seafloor isn't actually flat. It's actually got just as many, if not more features than the land above sea level. We have these abyssal plains, which are quite flat, that go down into oceanic trenches, which can be up to 12 kilometers deep. And then we have seamounts and volcanic islands that can actually almost hit the surface. Most of us are familiar with the intertidal or beach zone or the subtidal, which is actually quite shallow. But in fact, our seafloor extends all the way out to all the parts of Australia and indeed the world that are not actually above sea level on land. You might hear me during this webinar use two words. I might say benthic, which means seafloor or bottom. And I might say pelagic, which means in the water. So that's all the rest of the stuff um, in our ocean environment. Now, when we map over the land, this is actually, we're trying to find information that we can use to tell us where and what is on the land. And this is actually quite familiar to us. So we use a lot of different software platforms to do this. And I can't see you, but I would like you right now to raise your hand if you're familiar with any of these that I've got on the screen. Google Earth, Apple Maps, Google Maps. I'm sure there's a bunch of other out there. Now, if I'm guessing right, most people in the class have their hands up or are familiar with these platforms, these software apps. And the reason we can do this is because we have these satellites circling around, circling around the Earth. And they're taking pictures of our Earth, Earth observations. And this lets us see what's on land. So now we're just going to go into Google Earth and we're going to have a look at an area I'm familiar with right outside Canberra. And this is the King's Highway. And with our satellite imagery, we can actually see the road to the, from Canberra to the beach. We can see the trees. We can see some rocky outcrops there. And it's actually quite good imagery um, when you consider this is actually collected from orbit around our Earth. Now, when we're talking about mapping over the ocean, let's try and use the same system. Let's try and use our satellites, Google Earth, Apple Maps, or Google Maps. And we're going to take that satellite imagery, but now instead of looking over the land, we're actually going to try and look over the ocean. So moving on from the King's Highway from Canberra to the coast, where I'm familiar, we get to this place called Browley, which is a really popular destination on long weekends for Canberra, Canberrans. And so if you look over Browley, you can see that we can still see the land and the city, the village, but when we go into the ocean, we can't see through the water. All we can see is the surface of the water. We can see a little bit on the beach, but that's it. Once we get deeper, we can't see through that water column, um, particularly in deep waters. So how do we know what the seafloor looks like? I want you all right now to imagine that you're holding a ball. This can be whatever ball you want, but make sure it's a circular ball. So a soccer ball, a volleyball, a basketball, a handball, doesn't matter. Just imagine that you're holding it. Now imagine that you're dropping it from different heights. So farther down on the ground, really close to the ground, you're dropping the ball. And now imagine that you're getting higher and you're starting to stand and you're still dropping that ball. I want you to figure out or think about whether it takes the same time for the ball to return to your hand after you drop it if you're at different heights. Now what you've probably thought of is that it won't. So if the ball is very close to the ground, it returns to your hand quite quickly. But as you stand up, it returns slower. And imagine if you were dropping it from a roof. It would actually take a little bit longer to get back to your hand. And so this is actually the same technique that we use to figure out the depth of our seafloor. And this is called bathymetry. It's a big word, 
but it's an important word, particularly for people like me, and it means seafloor depth. Now I want you to imagine a second scenario. Imagine dropping that same ball from the same height this time, but this time onto different surfaces. And we want to ask a new question. Will that ball, being bounced on different surfaces, bounce back to the same height? So imagine dropping your ball onto rock, then gravel, and then finally sand. Will that ball bounce back? And the answer is it actually won't. If you drop it on rock, it bounces back to a pretty good height. But if you drop it on sand, it hardly even gets off the ground. And so the strength of its return is diminished according to the surface that you're using. Now this, unlike bathymetry, is similar to how we measure backscatter. And that is seafloor hardness. Now that might seem like a silly thing to measure. Who cares how hard the seafloor is? But it's actually really important to a lot of different kinds of animals and other biological communities that live in the seafloor. Many of them, like corals and sponges and what we call ascidians and bryozoans, they love hard surfaces. And so it's one of ways that we can try and figure out what's actually on the seafloor by measuring this backscatter. So how do we actually do this? Obviously, we're not going out and using a ball to drop down onto the ocean seafloor. We actually use a multi-beam sonar system that is mounted on the bottom of a vessel. And this sonar system sends a pulse of sound, high frequency sound, down to the seafloor, which then bounces back to the vessel to a receiver. And we do this over and over among what we call a swath of seafloor, a swath of ocean um, to measure the seafloor. And it's actually called mowing the lawn, what we do. And you can see here on the top, the vessel going back and forth, getting these beautiful swaths of bathymetry and backscatter that we can then use. When we get them, the signals back, there's software programs that put these together and we have geophysicists that interpret them and process them to correct for things like tide and other kinds of error. These are then put, put together in programs to make these really beautiful bathymetric maps. And this shows us the different features, the different seamounts, valleys, plains, and channels on the seafloor. And we code it with colors, blue usually meaning deeper, and red usually meaning shallower. And it gives us this really beautiful map that's almost on par with what you see um, in the terrestrial stuff from the satellite imagery. And these are just some of the beautiful images that we've acquired from previous surveys. So here you can see Gifford Guyot, which is a flat-topped seamount located near the Coral Sea in Australia. And you can see that our multi-beam surveys in the bathymetry have revealed all these beautiful features on the seamount that we normally wouldn't have known about. We've also got a picture here of a deep hole or a sacred site to some of the local indigenous groups. This is up north in the Timor Sea outside of Darwin. And this hole is actually very important because although right now the entire area is covered by ocean, tens of thousands of years ago it was actually a billabong. So that blue area was still water, but the orange area, which is about 50 meters submerged now, was actually a place where people could go to fish and congregate. Um, and so the bathymetry that we collected revealed this feature and let us kind of figure out what was going on with humans a long time ago. Now, I'm sure all of you know this, but Australia is very much an ocean country. We have a great piece of land, but we have even more ocean. So here you can see Australia, but you can also see in this darker blue bit that our ocean area, which we call our exclusive economic zone. And this area is actually bigger than the mainland. So it's 8.2 million square kilometers, as opposed to the mainland, which is 7.7 .7 million square kilometers. So we have a lot more ocean than we do land that we're responsible for in Australia. But we actually have even more than this, because I'm guessing that many of you haven't considered Antarctica. So we do have an Australian Antarctic territory. And when you add that ocean area into what we have on the mainland or off the mainland, we have almost 10 million square kilometers of ocean territory that is under Australia's marine jurisdiction. So we are responsible as a nation for knowing what's in this area, in this ocean area. How, how can we map it? How can we understand what's there? It's a huge area. But why do we really care about mapping the seafloor? What can it tell us? I mean, other than making those really cool maps I showed you before, 
what is it actually telling us? So right now, I'm gonna give your teachers or parents or you a chance to pause the video and to think, and if you have somebody else with you, pair up and then share your answers to this question. So go ahead and do that now if you want to stop. All right, for those of you that chose to do the activity, I hope it fostered some interesting discussion, maybe some creative answers. For those of you that didn't do the activity, no dramas, I'll go through some of the answers now. So we're gonna talk very briefly about why we care about mapping a seafloor. So I put a few reasons here. They're all quite different actually, um, but this isn't exhaustive. There's more reasons that I'm not gonna cover in the presentation today. So just because your answer isn't on here doesn't mean it's wrong. So we care about mapping the seafloor because it helps us map the habitats. And when I say habitats, I'm talking about the smaller scale structures and animals and plants and other organisms that live on the seafloor. And so by having some seafloor knowledge of the different types of features there and if the substrate is hard or soft, we can kind of figure out what might be there. And we can overlay that biological knowledge onto that geological knowledge and actually start to try and predict what might be in other areas that we haven't yet explored. We need to know about the seafloor, particularly different structures and whether it's hard or soft, so that we can better design the laying of our pipeline, marine cables, and other infrastructure that we use, um, usually going from offshore to the land. We also use seafloor maps to help inform things like tsunami hazard modeling. And this is really important because the shape of the seafloor actually affects the ocean and currents and how it comes up to the coast. And this is particularly important when you're talking about tsunamis and how they might impact coastal communities. We use it for coastal modeling to try and figure out how the currents might be working, changing over time, and how this might actually affect the coastlines themselves, where we often have cities and other buildings. We use it to design infrastructure, particularly in island or coastal communities. This is important because we wanna make sure that these communities are protected from storm surges and sea, and all of that is related to the seafloor shape around the particular community that we're talking about. We also use seabed maps to figure out how sediment or the dirt in the ocean might be transported. And this is important because as the sediment moves around, it can affect certain underground infrastructure that's built there. It can affect coastal communities. And it also just gives us a really good story about some of the processes in the area over time. And then finally, perhaps one of the most traditional ways of using C4 maps is for charting. So this is really important for any sort of navigation at sea and safety at sea, because you do not want to be on a boat and accidentally go over a bank or a shoal that's just below the surface that you can't see, but that can actually scrape the bottom of your boat or really impact it badly. And so charting helps keep us safe when we're at sea. So those are just some of the ways that we need to use C4 maps. Now, what animals live in the deep? I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm actually a marine ecologist, and an ecologist is someone who looks at the physical aspects of the environment and relates it to the biological. And so I do a lot of um, work spent looking at seabed maps and the different um, geomorphology and different aspects of those and relating it to what's there and why. And so during some of my surveys and expeditions, I've uncovered some incredible stories and some awesome animals in the deep bit of the webinar to share those with you. So I'm going to go through a few animals and um, my first one and one of my arguably one of my most favorite animals ever is the glass sponge. So you might think this is a plant or some sort of alien but it's actually one of the more primitive multicellular animals and it is like its namesake says actually made out of glass. So it is a silica skeleton with a very thin layer of cells over the top and there are lots of different species of these hexactinellids or glass sponges in the deep sea. And each species has a different shape and different ways of interacting with the environment. They do often like hard substrate. So you can see here that there's quite a lot of glass sponges hanging on this overhang in the deep sea, but they can also exist by burying their spicules, which are the glass filaments that they make, into the sand of the abyssal plains. And I actually have one right here that we collected from about 3,000 meters deep. So this is part of an animal, believe it or not. It's actually a bundle of very long 
glass spicules. So these are made out of glass. And you can see that the animal has actually twisted them together as it formed. And this was in the substrate, in the soft sediment, anchored down with the actual sponge top, which I don't have, at the very top of it to try and take advantage of the passing current so that it can filter feed small animals out of the ocean. So I think these are absolutely amazing. And these spicules are used in materials engineering. Some of them have very intricate lattices. And they're also used in fiber optics research because they do have a really wonderful um, light transmission um, ability. And so we saw this, you can actually shine a torch on the bottom of the spicule in the dark, and it'll make this lovely 80s style fiber optics display where the light comes out of the top. So they are definitely one of my favorites, glass sponges. So next on our list is infauna. This is a group of animals that I'll talk about in just a minute. But first I want you to imagine that you're at the beach. Lovely sandy beach, not too much around. You're digging your toes in the sand, feeling pretty good about life. And we have similar kind of, I guess, barren areas of sand or dirt or mud in the deep sea. So this is an image of an abyssal plain at about 4,000 meters deep or four kilometers deep. And it just shows, doesn't show a lot of animals, does it? There's not much living on the seafloor here, or at least that's what we think. Actually, there are heaps of infauna. Now, infauna are animals or other organisms that live within the grains of sand or mud in these seemingly barren areas. So these areas are actually teeming with life, but that life is quite small and it's underneath the ground or the seafloor. This is infauna. This is what they look like. So you can see these here have been photographed under a microscope, so they're blown up a bit in image, but all of these animals live between the grains of sediment. We often find really weird tracks that they leave behind. So this here, the spider trace, is an example of an informal track from something that lives underneath the surface. We actually have no idea what it is. And this is why I love deep sea research, just because we keep finding new and interesting animals and organisms that live down there. And this is one of my favorites. This is a polychaete worm, which often travels beneath the sediment as infauna. And it almost kind of looks like an alien, quite scary. If I were its size, I would be quite scared having this come after me, but they are actually quite small. But to give you an idea of the structure of this predator's mouth parts, its eyes are these tiny little black dots just right up here. And these are its equivalent of teeth. I often think that is the inspiration for those of you that might be a bit older and know what the Aliens movie franchise is. Now there's a lot of organisms in the deep sea that use bioluminescence, and this is because in the deep sea there is no light. But many animals still have eyes and visual abilities, and so light is actually a big attractant for a lot of prey. And so you'll find some predators use light to attract prey or mates, and here we've got the anglerfish that uses a, a bioluminescent lure to attract its prey right near its mouth. Very convenient. We have these fish called ipnops. There's actually quite a few that do this that have a bit of bioluminescence in their um, op optical cavity. We have a lot of gelatinous organisms, such as this tenophore here, which can use bioluminescence. And then this is one of the more stunning things I've ever seen on a survey. Um, this is a bioluminescent squid that uses the flashing lights in a very disco ball kind of way, a um, very dramatic way, it turns them off and on um, at a moment's notice. And it's, it's just spectacular watching it underwater. Now this is another funny organism. Um, they are very unknown, I guess, to the general public, but I think they're pretty cool. They're called acorn worms and they are very common in the deep sea, but we know very little about them because they are so very fragile that when we try to bring them up to investigate them further, they have fallen apart. They're almost like jelly and they just dissipate completely by the time we get them to the surface. So a lot of our knowledge of acorn worms is based on images from um, deep sea cameras. And so here you can see an acorn worm that was off near the Coral Sea in the Great Barrier Reef in the deep sea. And these guys are really interesting because they're actually more closely related to vertebrates, which is us, than any other invertebrate. So these are actually, I guess in a way, your cousins. And they're also very interesting because they're detritivores. So they actually ingest the sediment 
and take the little animals and infauna out of it to eat. And then they poo out the sediment in this beautiful little spiral trail. And the spiral is actually done because it's the most optimal way of um, foraging or feeding in a nutrient poor environment like the abyssal plains. But you can find these spirals that persist for quite some time after the acorn worm has swum off. And so that's how we always know they're there. Azenophyophores are another very interesting deep sea animal. These are something I didn't know much about until I started to work in the deep sea because they're very prevalent down there, but not other environments. Now, if you look in this image here of an abyssal plain with a rocky outcrop, you can see these tiny little white things sticking up on the surface. These are actually xenophyophores. Now, they don't look like much, but when you zoom in on them and you look at them in all their glory, you can see that they have a huge range of different shapes. Now, these shapes we think are indicative of different species, but the really cool thing about these organisms is that they're actually single cells. They're almost like an amoeba, and that, that amoeba sends out its little pseudopods and selects certain parts of the sediment or certain parts of the environment to build this house that we call a test. And that house is very distinct according to the species. So over here, you can see that there's a xenophyophore that used kind of muddy sand grains to make its test. Here, this xenophyophore just preferred to use glass sponge spicules. So it actually used another organism's body part to make its home. And this one right here was one that we collected with this push core, and it used actually other forams, which are single-celled organism shells, to construct its house. You can see this 3D image here of that particular foram, and to me it's just amazing that something that is a single cell can make this elaborate structure to house its softer body. So that's the end of this webinar. I hope you learned a lot about seabed mapping, have an appreciation for how and why we do it, and also that I sparked a bit of interest in some deep sea animals. So you can find some further resources over at deepoceaneducation.org. You can also find that a lot of vessels um, broadcast all of their science and videos that they're collecting in deep sea areas on their YouTube channels. And one of these is the Schmidt Ocean Institute channel, and you can see what's happening on its vessel, the RV Falkor, in real time, which is very cool. And then finally, you can check out more information about seabed mapping and earth sciences in general over at ga.gov.au backslash education, which has a lot of different videos, activity packs, and teacher resources for classrooms and home learning. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy your ocean adventures.